Good morning and welcome to our live stream service here at Sayasa Gospel Church. I'm going to begin uh, this morning by reading from Psalm chapter 63. O God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you, as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory. Because your steadfast love is better than life, my lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live. In your time I will lift up my hands. My soul will be satisfied as with fat and rich food, and my mouth will praise you with joyful lips. When I remember you upon my bed and meditate on you in the watches of the night, if you have been my help, and in the shadow of your wings I will sing for joy, my soul clings to you, your right hand upholds me. But those who seek to destroy my life shall go down into the depths of the earth. They shall be given over to the power of the sword. They shall be a portion for jackals. But the king shall rejoice in God. All who swear by him shall exult, for the mouths of liars will be stopped. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you would cause our souls to really hunger and thirst for you. Well, that we would then go to you and seek after you, for you are the fountain of living water. May we not go to the empty cisterns that hold no water, those broken cisterns, but to you, the fountain of living water. May we find our, our rest and our satisfaction and joy in you alone. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who came into the world to save sinners that we might have everlasting joy in the presence of God forever. We pray for our service now. We ask you to move by your Holy Spirit, Lord, even in these difficult times and in strange ways, Lord, as we are not able to meet together, but doing this remotely, we pray that your word would go forth with power and that your Holy Spirit would convict hearts of their need for you and encourage and build up your church. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So please join with us as we sing a few songs to the Lord. Uh, the first song is the hymn, The Solid Rock. So please, wherever you are at home, uh, read along and, and sing along with us this morning. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. When darkness seems to his face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the lift. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. His oath is covered. Is 
My next song is Have Thine Own Way, Lord. Good morning. We're glad you are with us or with this live feed. Let's just bow our hearts again and pray. As we look at our imaginations, it's a gift that God has given all of us. They're quite vivid, our imaginations. But unless Jesus Christ controls them by his spirit and word, they are wild imaginations. They're not according to the will of God. Let's pray. Father, again, we humble ourselves beneath your word. David tells us in the Psalms that you have magnified your word above all your name. Because by your word... We keep ourselves from the paths of destruction. Your word is that lamp to our feet, that light to our path. Lord, it, we pray you illuminate our hearts now through the word of truth and dispel all fables, dispel and destroy all vain, empty, wicked imaginations and leave us with the mind of Christ. We want the mind of Jesus Christ. We thank you and praise you in his name. Name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Our scripture, our main text is found in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 10 verses 4 and 5. I wish I could get this microphone thing here. Right, okay. That's better. 2 Corinthians 10, 4 and 5. The Apostle Paul writing to the believers says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, they're not fleshly, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations that's right the sword of the spirit one of the weapons has been given to us freely by God Almighty to cast down our imaginations and every high thing every proud thing 
that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity, yes, that's why we're called slaves and servants of Jesus Christ. We are brought into captivity. But remember, he whom the Spirit sets free is free indeed. Bringing into captivity, not some of our thoughts, not most of our thoughts, but every thought to the obedience of Jesus Christ. If you're a parent, you know that you want your children to always be obedient. You're not happy with partial obedience. You don't reward partial obedience. And neither does God. He wants us to be fully obedient, to have all our imaginations and thoughts brought into the obedience of Jesus Christ. Now, there are some main points in these verses here that are very important. Number one, we are in a warfare. We are at war, not with flesh and blood, but against spiritual powers of darkness. We believers have been given weapons, mighty weapons of God. These are not fleshly weapons. They are supernatural weapons, spiritual weapons. These weapons are able to pull down all the strongholds or fortresses that are built up in our lives. The strongholds, which are our, our imaginations and our thoughts. These exalt themselves against God. That's called pride. And they need to be brought into captivity of obedience to Jesus Christ. When the world speaks of imaginations, they say, let your imaginations run wild. Think of whatever you want to be, whatever you want to do. Not God's will, it's your will. Right? What thou wilt, okay? That's the philosophy of the world. Let your imaginations run wild. God says, let me have your imaginations, let me have your every thought, that I may control them and change them, redirect them, heal them, purify them, sanctify them. Why? Well, for two reasons. Isaiah 65, 2 says, all day long I have held out my hands, this is God speaking, to an obstinate Stubborn people who walk in ways not good. Why? Pursuing their own imaginations, their own thoughts and devices. In other words, when we follow our own imaginations, when we let our thoughts, our desires, our dreams rule our lives and direct us rather than God's word and spirit, we go into ways that are not good for us. They're not good. They walk in ways not good because they pursue their own imaginations. God knows what is good for us. And our own imaginations, left to our own devices, it is not good. Secondly, Romans 1.21. Because that when they knew God, that is through creation, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain, that means empty, in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. And so, God says, I want your imaginations, because it will lead you into ways that are not good, they are empty, and it will leave your heart darkened. Oswald Chambers says, undisciplined imagination is the greatest disturber, not only of growth in grace, but of spiritual sanity. We're going to look at some biblical characters, some godly biblical characters, who were losing their sanity because they did not bring their imaginations, their thoughts, into the control of God. So again, the world says, let your imaginations run wild. Let them go wild. Any which way. As long as it pleases you. As long as it benefits you. You and your business and your family, let your imaginations go wild. And again, God says, let me have your imagination. Let me control your thoughts. Let me change. 
the direction of your thinking. Because your thoughts lead in a way not good. Your thoughts are empty and lead to darkness of soul. There was in the early 20th century a popular guru, self-help guru, by the name of Oliver Napoleon Hill. He was an American self-help self author. His best-known book, and still being read today, you can still buy them in bookstores, was entitled Think and Grow Rich, written in 1937. And that book is among the 10 best-selling self-help books of all time. I did some research into Mr. Napoleon Hill, and I have met people who still read his books and are disciples of his thinking. In one of his books, he described an encounter. He was typing, writing one, a new book, and he said, disembodied spirits from the Himalayas came and they hovered over his head. And he began to automatically type. He called these spirits master. They were from the school of wisdom. They revealed to him secret knowledge. These disembodied spirits he called good. The Bible would call them demonic. And as he was typing these disembodied evil spirits gave him a secret to success which many follow today. And that is this. Whatever the human mind can conceive, it can achieve. Whatever the human mind can conceive, whatever your imagination comes up with, it can achieve. This is, in essence, let your imaginations run wild. Napoleon Hill said, Imagination is the fifth step towards riches. Imagination is the workshop where all your plans are created. Desire is given shape, form, and action through your imaginations. You can create anything you can imagine, says Napoleon Hill. Why is this philosophy so popular today? It was back in the 1930s, the 40s, the 50s, the 60s. Today it's still popular. Why is it so popular? Because much of it is true. Now just don't take my word for it. Let's listen to what God says about the imagination of sinners in the Bible. In Genesis chapter 11, verse 4, after the great deluge, after Noah's flood, people began to spread out over all the face of the earth. And in pride, they said, recorded in Genesis 11, 4, Let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach into heaven, and let us make a name, a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. God was not pleased with their actions of pride. And we read in verse 6, the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language, and this they began to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. God saw the danger of wild imaginations. God did not destroy their imagination when he confounded the languages. He just made it more difficult for man to imagine. But God knew the danger of human, unsanctified, unholy imaginations. And this teaching of let your imagination go wild, do as thou wilt, think of yourself as number one, Put your desires first. This vain philosophy, which is totally against the teaching and Holy Scripture, 
which again says we are to bring all our thoughts into the captivity of Christ. This vain and empty philosophy has invaded the church of the 20th century. There was a very popular preacher by the name of Norman Vincent Peale who taught the power of positive thinking. And he regards Napoleon Hill as a great teacher. He said Napoleon Hill has a rare gift of inspiring and helping people. And Norman Vincent Peale said, I owe him a personal debt of gratitude for the helpful guidance I've received from his and writings like his. Norman Vincent Peale was a false teacher. Tens of thousands followed his instructions and bought his books. You know that Norman Vincent Peale, who was influenced by Napoleon Hill, who had, was influenced by Satan and the disembodied spirits from the Himalayas, do you know that Norman Vincent Peale Influence many great people like President Eisenhower, President Nixon, Robert Schuller, Billy Graham, and our current president, Donald Trump. You know that President Trump's parents would take him to Norman Vincent Peale's church, the Marble Collegiate Church in Manhattan, to hear him preach. Norman Vincent Peale officiated at Donald Trump's first wedding. Donald Trump credits Norman Vincent Peale's philosophy with saving him from his first bankruptcy. President Trump calls Norman Vincent Peale my pastor and one of the great, greatest preachers, preachers ever. The influence of Napoleon Hill, of those Himalayan spirits, those demons are still active today, even in the White House. In Genesis 6, 5, we read that God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination, every thought of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Now, what is evil? Murder is evil, adultery is evil, homosexuality is evil, but the Bible says all sin is called evil. Remember when Jesus was facing a great audience one day, and he said, if you being evil, that's right, every one of you, you children, you grandmothers and grandfathers, you scribes and Pharisees, if you then, being evil, give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit and good things to them that ask? C.S. Lewis said, according to most Christian teachers, the essential vice, the utmost evil is pride. It's not just murder and adultery. Not just homosexuality, fornication. Covetousness is evil. Pride is evil. There are many evils. And if we then, being evil, know how to give good gifts, how much more do we need the Holy Spirit, our Heavenly Father, to give that spirit so that our thoughts can come under his control? Our imaginations are vain. They lead us in the wrong way. We... Imagine God in the wrong way. We think he's either unforgiving, totally unforgiving, or that he's just a pushover. We imagine others in the wrong way. We imagine ourselves wrongly. I'd like to take you to some examples in Scripture of how vain, empty, unsanctified, though not necessarily wicked as we would think, but yet evil imaginations brought God's people distress. In Numbers chapter 13, verse 27, now here we come across the spies. Moses sent 12 spies into the land of Canaan, the promised land. 
And remember, beloved, God has promised you many things. But because of the vain imaginations of these ten spies, they were not able to inhabit the promise of God. And there are many promises that God has given us in His Word that His people, called by His name, cannot inherit because of their vain imaginations. And the ten spies, the ten unbelieving spies, spoke to Moses and said, We came unto the land whither thou sentest us, and surely it flows with milk and honey, and this is the fruit of it. They gathered one cluster of grapes, and they carried it on a pole on the shoulders of two men. What a land that was, flowing with milk and honey. Surely, this is a land of plenty. They go on to tell Moses, nevertheless, so on one hand we have this bounty of grapes, fruitful land, just as God promised, but on the other hand, nevertheless, the people there be strong and dwell in the land, and the cities are walled and very great. And moreover, we saw the children of Anak there, the giants. And that is not in a vain imagination. That was reality. Okay? The people that dwelt in that land were strong. They did live in great walled cities like Jericho. Their imaginations were true at that time. We read on in verse 31. They said, but the men that went up with him said, we be not able. Here is where our imaginations, our thoughts keep us from inheriting the promises of God. We be not able to go up against the people for they are stronger than we. And they brought up, and notice, an evil report. When they said, we cannot, they were speaking evil. They brought up an evil report of the land, which they had searched. And they said, there we saw the giants. That's true. And the sons of Anak, which come of the giants. And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers. And we, so we were in their sight. You know, it's okay to see ourselves as grasshoppers. We are to think of ourselves as small. We are to humble ourselves and consider ourselves to be helpless as a grasshopper, to be nothing as a grasshopper. But their imaginations went on wildly to say, so we were in their sight. And because of that, they wandered 40 years. And 40 years later, Joshua sends more spies into Jericho. And they meet Rahab. And she hides them. And she said to the men, I know that the Lord has given you the land, this land. And that your terror is fallen upon us. That all the inhabitants of the land faint because of you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt. And what he did unto the two kings of the Amorites that were on the other side of Jordan. Sihon and Org, whom you utterly destroyed. And as soon as we had heard these things, our hearts did melt. Neither did there remain any more courage in any man because of you, for the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and in earth beneath. Notice the words that Rahab used to define the minds of the people in Jericho, including their armies. She used the word terror. We became faint, our hearts melted, and we had no courage. No. The people of Jericho did not see the Israelites as grasshoppers, but as giants because of their God. You see, we too, like those ten spies, can bring about an evil report. 
We say, I can't. I can't love my enemies. I can't turn the other cheek. I can't be holy. I cannot forgive that person. I cannot stop loving the money or loving the world. I cannot set all my affection on the things above as God commands. I cannot sever my affections from this world. I cannot stop coveting this world. I cannot stop hating. We are bringing up an evil report. Now Joshua and Caleb were different. They also spied out the land, but they were different. Caleb, right after the ten spies said, well, we can't possess it. Caleb stilled the people before Moses because of the turbulence and said, let us go up at once and possess it. For we are well able to overcome it. And then later he and Joshua said together, if the Lord delight in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land which flows with milk and honey. Only rebel not ye against the Lord. See what happens when we say, I can't forgive that person or I can't love my enemy. I can't live a holy life as God's word not just suggests, but commands that we do, giving us the power to do it. We are re rebels rebelling against God. Rebel not against the Lord, neither fear ye the people of the land. And when we fear and when we worry, we are rebelling against God. Bread for us. Do you know that all your enemies, whether they be flesh and blood enemies or diseases or poverty, that those enemies of yours are bread for you? The things that cause you to fear, the things that cause you to worry, are supposed to do the opposite. They are to feed you. They are to be bread for you. Their defense has departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Fear them not. The Lord is not with everyone. During World War II, German soldiers had inscribed on their belt buckles, not just the Nazis, but even the regular Wehrmacht army, Gott mit uns, God with us. But God wasn't with them. He was not with their militias and their armies and the Holocaust. He was not with those soldiers. He was not with Hitler and the Nazis. But yet they said, Gott mit uns. Why? Because they did not act like Joshua and Caleb. And what made the difference between Joshua and Caleb and the other spies? You say, well, God controlled their thoughts. Yes, he controlled their imagination. They did not imagine themselves in the eyes of the people of Jericho as grasshoppers but as well able to overcome it. But how? What made the difference between Joshua and Caleb? One word, it's called faith. Faith. It comes down to faith. Charles Spurgeon said, the worst evils of life are those which do not exist except in our imagination. If we had no troubles but real troubles, we should not have a tenth part of our present sorrows. We feel a thousand deaths in fearing one. But the Christian is cured of the disease of fearing. How is the Christian cured? By faith. Fear not, said Jesus, it is I. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. You believe in God, you trust in God, now trust in me. Faith. Trust is the enemy of fear. The enemy of our own imaginations that cause fear and worry. You know, Moses imagined himself killed by Pharaoh, so he fled to the wilderness. He imagined that the Israelites would rally around him when he killed the Egyptian soldier, but he imagined wrong. Because he imagined wrong and vainly, he fled. You know, David imagined himself to be killed by Saul, even after God 
had anointed him as king. So he fled to the Philistines, even rode against Israel in battle with them. Elijah, the great prophet, after calling down fire from heaven and destroying the prophets of Baal, he imagined himself killed by Jezebel. So he fled. He sat down and wished to die. Jonah imagined himself killed by the Ninevites for preaching God's word. So he fled to Tarshish to try and get away from the presence of the Lord. See what happens to even righteous people when we do not daily bring our thoughts into captivity? We begin to flee, even just coast away from the presence of the Lord. In 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 15, we read of the Syrian army that surrounded the town of Elisha the prophet. And Elisha's servant, Gehazi, came to him. When the servant of the man of God was risen early and gone forth, behold, a host compassed the city, both with horses and chariots those of the Syrians. And a servant, Gehazi, said to him, Alas, my master, how shall we do? He wasn't just asking, what can we do to avoid this problem? No, he was speaking in fear. Very often when we look for solutions to our dilemmas, we do so in fear and not faith. Joshua and Caleb knew they had a dilemma. There were giants in the land, and we face giants every day. Some temptations are like horrible giants, and when they come to us, the earth shakes. But faith overcomes them. No, Gehazi wasn't just saying, Master Elisha, what means should we take to escape this? No, because we read in Elisha's answer, Fear not. Gehazi came fearing, trembling, beside himself, panic. And Elisha said, Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. You know, many in the churches today don't realize that. Oh, they may ascribe to it on paper and sing about it, but when it comes to face a problem, it's not real to them. Because their faith is small, it's withering, it's dying. Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes, the eyes of my servant, that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. Gehazi saw those chariots and angels of God with his naked eyes. Elisha saw them with the eyes of faith. There's a big difference. We don't need to see with our naked eyes the angels that surround us. Faith is the evidence of things hoped for not, not seen. Faith is the evidence. The substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. It's faith. And the more faith we have, the more we see the unseen realm. It comes down to faith. Another example in the Bible of a man who almost lost his healing, his deliverance from leprosy, because of his vain, wild imagination. We read of Naaman, the Syrian captain or general. Naaman was pointed to go to Samaria and speak to the prophet Elisha and ask for healing of his leprosy. And when Naaman got there, Elisha didn't even come out of the house, but said, go and dip yourself seven times in the river Jordan and you shall be made whole. And we read, but Naaman was angry. And he went away and said, behold, I thought, or this is what I imagined. I thought that he will surely come out to me, stand, call on the name of the Lord his God, strike his hand over the place and recover the leper, recover my body from this terrible disease. That empty, not controlled by the spirit imagination, 
would keep Naaman in his leprosy. Only when our imaginations come under the control of God's word and Holy Spirit by faith can there be healing for our souls. Sometimes healing for our bodies, yes. But always healing for the soul. Always healing for the soul, or sometimes for the body. And so Naaman recanted of his vain imaginations and believed the word of the prophet. And he did baptize himself seven times without the hand of the prophet there. And he was delivered from his disease. Now what I've said so far may raise some questions such as, when God takes, takes control of our imaginations, as he commands, when our thoughts, our desires, our wishes, our imagination comes into bondage to the word of God, and a sweet bondage it is, through faith, when our imaginations are controlled by God through faith, doesn't that, wouldn't that stifle our creativity? Gee, we're going to stop creating now. We're going to stop thinking of what we want to do and how to do that. Doesn't it stifle and thwart our creativity? No, not in the least. Faith in Jesus Christ, my friend, is putting faith in the creator of everything. The Bible says in Colossians that all things were created by Jesus Christ and for Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the great inventor. He invented gravity. He invented oxygen. He invented this planet. He invented our solar system. He invented our galaxy. He invented the universe. He is the greatest inventor of all times. And when you put your faith in him, you are connecting to the great inventor. And now his thoughts, which the Bible says are higher than our thoughts, his thoughts begin to become our thoughts. Let me just share with you the testimonies and examples of three men. Starting on the left, we have George Washington Carver. And then we have a man by the name of Gary Starkwitter. And then Samuel Morse. These three men, just a few among many scientists and inventors, were devout Christians. George Washington Carver was an inventor. He once prayed, God, show me the secrets of the universe. That's a big prayer. And God said, no, I'm going to show you the secrets of a peanut. Who wants to see the secret of a peanut? But when God unfolded in Mr. Carver's mind, in his imagination, the secrets of the peanut... Tremendous things happened. For there are about 300 uses of the peanut. No, he didn't invent peanut butter. But peanut butter came from Mr. Carver's work with the peanut. Cosmetics, paint, oil, marble, plywood, even the use of dye in Crayola crayons all came from God unlocking in his mind the secret of the peanut. And you know, Mr. George Washington Carver always gave glory to God. And he said, the Lord has guided me. And without my Savior, I am nothing. I am nothing. The next individual on the screen, a man by the name of Gary Starkwetter. He worked for... Apple, Microsoft, and Xerox, he invented the laser printer. And he says it was inspired by God. Another devout, born-again Christian who says all his work, not just the laser printer, 
was inspired by God, and he gives God glory. And then the third man on our right, on your right, is Samuel Morse, another devout Christian. A miraculous invention of sending electrical message through a wire called Morse code. And that eventually led to the telephone and the radio and the TV and to the internet and to the computer. On May 24th, 1844, Samuel Morse sent the first message via electricity from Washington to Baltimore. And it was just a few words from the Bible, from Numbers 23, 23. What hath God wrought? I don't mean to sound that like a question. It wasn't a question. What has God wrought? In other words, see what God has done. See what God is doing. This is his invention. Later on, Mr. Morse explained it further and said, Not unto us, not unto us, but to God be all the glory. Not what man hath done, but what God has done. What God has wrought. What did these three men need to change their selfish ambitions? Their vain, empty imaginations? From that vanity to God-glorifying imagination? One thing, faith. Trusting in God. Believing in his word. I'd like to conclude with sort of a, a sad story from the Bible of King Saul. King Saul was waiting for Samuel to come and offer the sacrifice before battle. And by the time Samuel got there, Saul had already committed this sacrilege act of disobedience and sacrificing himself this animal himself to God and Samuel approached him and asked him why he did this and Saul the king of Israel replied when I saw that the men were scattering his soldiers were scattering because the Philistines were assembling when I saw that the men my soldiers were scattering and that you did not come at the set time oh he did but he was anxious to get him there. And that the Philistines were assembling at Mishmash. I thought, now the Philistines will come down against me. Now I thought, I imagined that because you were not here, I imagined this, though God had promised us victory, that God had given us many victories before when we obeyed him and trusted him. Now I imagined that we wouldn't have the victory so I felt compelled to offer the burnt offering. Samuel said to him, you have acted foolishly. You have acted foolishly. You have not kept the command the Lord your God gave you. If you had, he would have established your kingdom over Israel for all time, forever. But now your kingdom will not endure. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart. And appointed him leader of his people. Because you have not kept the Lord's command. Beloved. What's sad about this. Is that Saul lost his crown. His throne. Was taken from him. Given to another. When the Lord commands us. To bring our thoughts into the captivity of Christ. It is for our good. Not just now but for eternity's sake. It is good. That we keep our crowns. This is how we work out our salvation in fear and in trembling. Through faith that obeys. In Revelation chapter 3. The Lord Jesus personally speaks to the church of Philadelphia 
one of two churches of the seven that did not have to repent, that God praised. And he said to the church of Philadelphia, because thou hast kept my word with patience. In other words, you trusted in my word and you kept it. You obeyed me. Oh, there might have been failures at times, but you were people after my heart like David was. Remember, David had failure in his life too. But David, in remorse and tears, repented. He still was a man after God's own heart. The church of Philadelphia were men and women after God's own heart. And so they kept his word with patience. And God said, because of that, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon the whole world, to try them that dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly, said Jesus. I come quickly. This beautiful congregation, a Bible-believing, trusting in Jesus, Congregation, this beautiful people were warned by Jesus. Hold that fast. Hold my word fast. You're held fast, the Bible says, by faith. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. When God tells us, in our text, and I repeat it, to bring every thought into captivity is not just giving us some extracurricular work to do. This is one of the main works of the Christian. To go into all the world and preach the gospel and to take care of your soul. Remember what Solomon said. We studied this a couple of weeks ago. Where Solomon said, they made me keeper of the vineyards of the souls of Israel, but my own vineyard I did not keep. James says, pure religion, and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit the father, the widows and the orphans, their affliction, and keep yourself unspotted from the world. That's the pure religion. Go out, reach others, and go in, keep yourself clean. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. And what are those strongholds? It's our imaginations that cause us to disobey God, to cause us not to trust Him, to cause us to fear, to cause us to go away which is not good for us, to cause us to end up in darkness. They are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations. Casting down. You see, the imagination is a strong fortress. It is a high tower. And it exalts itself like the Tower of Babel was exalting itself against God. So our imaginations, unless they are willfully brought under the control of God's word and spirit by faith, they will continue to exalt themselves above God. We are to bring into captivity every thought into the obedience of Christ. So Solomon, who was made keeper of the vineyard of Israel, but did not keep his own vineyard, prayed in that song of Solomon, Come thou south, O north wind, and blow into my garden. That the spices may flow out, that you may eat your pleasant fruits. Prayer for the Holy Spirit. To awaken us, to enliven us, to make us want more of God's word. To be less of self and more of him. We'll close with this beautiful hymn. Breathe on me, breath of God. Come thou south. O north wind, or breath of God, blow into my vineyard, into my soul. Cleanse me. Captivate my thoughts so I do not walk in fear. Captivate my thoughts so I do not go outside your word and stray from the narrow path. Captivate my thoughts 
so I may hold on to my crown and endure unto everlasting life. Breathe on me, O breath of God. Make it a prayer. Breathe on me, breath of God. Fill me with life anew. That I may love as you have loved and do as you would do. Breathe on me, breath of God, until my heart is pure, until my will is one with yours, and do and to endure. Breathe on me, breath of God, fulfill my heart's desire, until this earthly part of me glows with your heavenly fire. Breathe on me, breath of God, so shall I never die, but live with you the perfect life of your eternity. In that second verse we sang, and hopefully you prayed, this is not just to be sung. It is to be prayed. Breathe on me, breath of God, until my heart is pure. Purified from what? Our own vain imaginations. Purified from thoughts that would lead us astray. Breathe on me, breath of God, till my heart is pure. Until my will is one with yours. To do and to endure. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your precious word. Yes, you have magnified your word above all your name. Why? Because there are many false Christs come into the world. Many who say they are a Messiah. Many who even come talking of Jesus. But yet we can tell them apart only by your word. Lord, may we be like the church of Philadelphia, who patiently keep and trust your word. And by so doing, we hold on to our crown. We must not let go of you, Lord. By letting go of you, we let go of our crown and all that you have promised us. Lord, we can live an abundant Christian life, a life filled with all of God's beauty. But we cannot be like the, those ten spies who say, I cannot. For to say, I cannot, is really to say, I will not. I do not want to. Do we want to be like Christ? Do we want to have every thought under his control? Do we want to bear his beauty? Do we want to do his will always? That should be the desire of our hearts. Oh Lord, change the desires of our heart. Change our imaginations. Control them now. We give ourselves to you with all our thoughts, our desires, our dreams, our ambitions, our imaginations, we give them to you, Lord. Let us not be influenced by the world who says, let your imaginations go wild. No, you want to tame them. You want to change them, to rearrange them, to sanctify them and make them holy, pleasing to you. We do that now, Lord. And every morning, throughout the day, we pray, Lord Jesus, take my thoughts and control them. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Amen.